So why are we here, first of all? We're here because the IMO has set a target for 2030 to reduce CO2 emissions per unit of transport work as an average across international shipping by at least 40% compared to 2008 levels. Part of the reason we brought this webinar on is because that we believe there's a lot of decisions to be made between now and 2023. And it's just around the corner. We had a meeting with ABS a few months ago and we were both discussing it and, and you know, possibly hoping that there'd been a little bit more movement, but we all had to wait for MEPC 76. So that's what we're trying to do here. Bring to the forefront some of the some of the decisions made in MEPC 76 and what it means for ship owners as we move forward. We've tried to make this webinar a little bit different, so we look at it from a bit of an overview. I'm going to start by giving a bit of an overview. Then we're going to look into the contractual side. Then we're going to look into the ABS and the technical side and what you need to do as a ship owner and how you can prepare for EEXI benchmarking or CII benchmarking, as it were. I'm going to quickly introduce the panel now. The rest of the panel needs no introduction, but I'm going to start off just to give you a brief background. My background is marine engineer and then fleet superintendent and technical superintendent. Then working at North, I've, I've been concentrating lately on a lot of fuel related topics and decarbonisation. So that's where we are part of the decarbonisation group, myself and Helen and some other members within the North, uh, North organisation. Helen uses her legal expertise to support American European members from, for FD&D. And whilst being involved in North Sanction Group, Helen's also involved in the decarbonisation working group. So we'll have plenty to add from the contractual side. Many of you may know David Davenport Jones, and David serves as ABS Director for Business Development for the UK, Spain and Portugal. With an international career, ever expanding in many different countries, with an increasingly important engineering and business development positions. And then Georgius, who many of you will be familiar with, Georgius serves as ABS Director for Global Sustainability, based in Athens, Greece, and is responsible for helping owners and operators develop fuel and operational strategies to meet sustainability goals. Georgius's previous roles, including development of power plants, turbo machinery, marine new builds, and classification societies. So there's a lot of experience here and hopefully we can guide you through this next part of the process and any questions we can help you answer either today or after the event. That's the idea. We're opening, opening up a challenge of communication here. So many of you will hear about EEXI and CII if you haven't heard of it already and, and what it's about. So I'm going to give a quick overview here and David and George will go into it a little bit more detail while Helen will look into it from the contractual side. So just to give you a brief overview, EEXI, it's an efficiency existing ship index and it applies to ships of 400 GT and over. They'll be required to calculate an attained EEXI and meet a required EEXI. And the outcome, there'll be an International Energy Efficiency Certificate, IEEC. But there'll be more detail on this as we go into the, the Classification Society part of the presentation. But Georgios will talk, and I'm sure because I've heard him mention it before, that this is a filter. So I'll let Georgios expand on that particular concept and exactly how that works. But the message I want to get across is the EEXI is a technical change. It's something which is going to be done to the vessel to change the vessel so that it meets the required standards for 2023. Whereas the CII is more of an operational measure and operational controls. So we'll go into that in more detail later, as we say. But the important thing to remember about EEXI is that it's a technical change. And it's expected to vessels to meet this requirement, the first annual survey after January the 1st, 2023. So what are the factors to consider and challenges in the short term? What type of vessel and when was it built? That's a very important consideration. And you'll see as we go throughout the, this presentation, how much of a bearing that has on the particular EEXI requirements. What are the trading patterns for this vessel and how long is the vessel going to be trading for? What's the charter party duration? We'll touch on that yet again throughout the contractual part of the presentation. Is power limitation an option? 
and for many power limitation will be the preferred option because it's the, the lowest cost option. But what about service speed? What about trading patterns? What about charters requirements? They're all factors to take into consideration. And which improvement measure is best suited? That may be down to power limitation, energy saving devices, in some cases, whole form and propeller optimization. And then we look at the last point, which is the cost of modifications and the time required, which is going to be very important because if you need to take your vessel out of service, the sooner you start planning this, the better really, and the easier it is for everybody. So that's just a brief overview of the EXI. CII, for those of you that don't have experience with it, you could draw some similarities with domestic goods such as washing machines in that you're always going to aim when you're buying the newest washing machine to get the most efficient and look for the best rating. And you know the system that's being used for shipping is not too dissimilar where you've got the major superior starting off at A, as we can see on this schematic here, going down, down to the inferior. And you don't need me to tell you that it's obviously the major superior which you're going to be aiming for. Now, this applies to vessels 5,000 gross tons and above, which is in line with the IMO DCS, the data collection system. The proposal will require that each vessel determined its annual operational carbon intensity indicator, and then the annual reduction factor they need to improve this is then applied. So it's expected that a ship rated at D, so this level here, which is the minor inferior, for three consecutive years, or E for one year, will be asked to provide some sort of corrective action plan. And this may have a negative impact on the financial and the chartering side of the operation. So, and what you have to remember in preparation for this, there's a ship energy efficiency management plan, SEEMP, which needs to be updated by 2023. Now, I'm sure you're all aware that port authorities, administrations, and other relevant stakeholders are encouraged to provide vessels which are going to meet the rating of A or B. So that goes without saying, really. Then after MEP 76, MEPC 76, there's been a lot of talk in the press about the reduction factors and how it's quite slight compared to what some member states were hoping for. This schematic here will hopefully help you to see why some are talking about a 2% reduction on a stage basis per annum, which leads to an 11% reduction by 2026. But this is a reduction factor relative to 2019. So that's why you may see in the press some discussing the 2% per annum and some simply referring to the 11% reduction by 2026. But there'll be more of that throughout the ABS classification part of this webinar. We're just going to quickly look at a few points here which we think are of relevance. So when you're looking at the operational efficiency, remember the carbon intensity indic indicator hinges on operational efficiencies. So one of the things here to look for is charterer port optimization. It's something that you know will will gain benefits in this area. Just in time shipping, you know, we've seen it done in container ships in the past. We're going to see more of that now, and we're going to see it applied to other areas. Voyage optimization, that's important. Smart vessels, remote monitoring to, to keep an eye on what the vessels are doing and monitoring it. A lot of the big shipping companies and liner operators now already have some form of smart vessel remote monitoring so they can assist and guide and look at the fleet of vessels and see how they're performing against their benchmark. And then weather routing is something else which will come into it and obviously have a bearing on the trading paddles of the vessel. Then we look at this last point here, which I just want to highlight, and that's R&D, research and development, working together. And that's extremely important as we go through this next period. Not only between ship owners, charters, and everybody else working in the industry, but you will all know about the USD $5 billion research fund, the IMRB, which will be more decided on in MEPC 77. And obviously a lot will hinge on COP26 too. But this is designed to accelerate the development of transition. And the, in addition to this, you will see additional calls from the EU, UK and US who are calling for zero emissions, 
within the next 30 years. There'll be more discussed on the other elements and factors which come into this, which include the EU ETS, the European Trading System, and what will be going on there. And also we have Sea Cargo Charter as well. So that will be discussed briefly as well. Just very quickly, just before we go on to the next bit, I just want to talk about fuels of the future here briefly. So what's to consider? It's more important than ever. The changes are going to be you know, a lot bigger. When we had the Sulphur Cap 2020, really you just had to consider whether you needed a scrubber or an exhaust gas cleaning system or you're going to use a different type of fuel. Now the infrastructure and bunk bunkering network for your vessel is going to be a lot more important as we head into this next period. So there's a lot more planning required. Bespoke vessel design, trade specific, we're going to see a lot more of that because as we've said previously, the infrastructure and bunkering is going to be focused on certain areas. From our angle and loss prevention, we think it's extremely important to look at the safety. And part of that is the crew training, expertise and qualifications. There's going to be a lot of changes there. You know, previously we've had motor and steam being the big, the big um, contributors, but we're going to have a lot of development and a lot of new technologies coming into it without the pool of expertise that we once had for other areas. So that's where educating comes into it. And that's what we're trying to do now by educating our members and passing it on to the shipping community as a whole. Then there's factors to consider with quality control and specifications and contamination. That's another major concern. The regulatory landscape, system approval and relevant charter party clauses. These are all areas which we're going to be discussing in a little bit of detail throughout this presentation. Then there's the big, big point to consider. And what we want to point out here is uh, well to wake. Um, for those of you not too familiar with it, it's a bit like the well to wheel concept in the automotive industry. Whereas, you know, it's, it's okay to say that a car, which is an electric, is producing a massive reduction, giving a massive reduction in CO2 emissions. But when you look at the whole manufacturing process and take it into consideration from start to finish, then you soon realize that it's, you know, there is a lot involved with it and there is a bit of a payback time. So the well to wake process on a ship is looking at right back to the oil well and taking everything into consideration, including all the production processes. Just to give you a couple of quick examples on that, biofuels, for example, when you look at them from a tank to wake basis, there's a relatively small drop in CO2 emissions. But when you go right the way back, and if it's made from sustainable sources, then you will see that the well to wake is a much fairer way of measuring. So that's something we urge the IMO to press on with and look at the well to wake as a whole. Another example of this is hydrogen and ammonia. And, you know, the no car carbon atom is there, but the actual production process is very fossil fuel dependent. So you could easily say that the actual latter part of using the hydrogen and ammonia doesn't create much CO2. But then when you look at the whole process back to the well, fossil fuels are involved. So it's important to take this all into consideration. We just want to show you now our Navigating Decarbonisation website, which is, which is for members and non-members free to look at and look at our material, which we're developing all the time. So please feel free to look at that at your own leisure. And then now we just want to go through a working example. The idea here is we're giving a working example of a fleet of vessels. We're going to look at it and we're going to look at what's required and what can be done from the classification society side of things, but also from the charter party angle as well. So we've got a hypothetical range of vessels here called Carbon Traders Limited is the name of the company. We've got six bulk carriers, 34,000 deadweight, five oil tankers of 156,000, and five 35, 3,500 TU container ships. Owners have undertaken EEXI benchmarking for the bulk carrier sister ships and are in the process of EEXI benchmarking for the tankers and container ships. Owners are now considering the impact the EEXI and CII requirements may have on the charter parties. So that will bring us on to the next slide. Now you can see Helen helped me choose the names here because the, the names are quite uh, interesting compared to some of the names I may have chose. 
So we've got scenario one, it's a bull carrier approaching the end of the current charter party and the long-term charter party spanning 2023. Owners need to negotiate the new charter party, EXI and CII in mind. And the benchmarking suggests for the IEC, power limitation in energy saving devices. So for CII, owners may wish to ensure that they can operate the vessel to meet this requirement. Scenario two, Emerald Seas. Owner usually voyage charters tankers, including Emerald Seas, and the intentions to make the vessel modifications to meet EEXI between charter parties. Owners are keen to address the operational measures in the charter party by discussing with charters. So they're opening up the conversation. That's what we're trying to get at here. And then scenario three, we have a container ship, which is existing charter party, doesn't cater for EEXI, CII, and charters propose the use of biofuel, which is something we're seeing more and more of now. So I just want to use this slide, which is the chicken and egg, and we're getting more and more questions, and this is what really give us the idea to, to bring this webinar on. We're getting questions from ship owners globally asking, well, you know, we need to decide on our charter party, but we're not too sure about the EXI benchmarking. So, you know, getting the vessels ready and they don't know which one to do first. That's sometimes the question. What we're trying to get, the message we're trying to get across is get yourself in as strong a stronger position as possible by carrying out the EXI benchmarking, know what technical modifications you need to make, get all this decided as early as possible, and then you can look at the charter party side of it, and it'll put you in to a better position, and you'll know exactly where you're starting from, the starting point. So the next slide here is just basically to say act now, and that's really if there's one thing all of you could take away from this webinar, it would be to, to start acting now at this. Owners will find themselves in a better position if they start looking at this at this moment in time and do not leave it too long. What we saw, for example, with the Sulphur Cup 2020 is owners that left it too late in the day to make the decisions were almost pushed into a corner with, with regards to dock availability, uh, exhaust gas cleaning systems, modifications and which type of fuels they use. So the earlier you start this process, the better the position you're going to be in. And before the webinar, just before I hand over to the next bit, we were asked a few questions. Now, we've tried to put all to these questions within the presentation. However, there's a few that we're going to just quickly going to cover now. And then I'm just going to ask David a couple of quick questions before we carry on to the next part of the presentation. So the first question we got asked was about penalty and enforcement, and there's nothing really being deciding on that at the moment. So that's something that will come at a later stage. Um, the other question we said is what exceptions are being agreed for CII, for example, cargo heating consumptions, and that will be moved on to MEPC 77, as far as we understand. Then the other, the other question we got asked was about um, NOx compliance and, and what happened in the most MEPC 76. Well, MEP 76 approved unified interpretations to the NOx technical code, which clarified requirements for testing and certification of engines with selective catalytic reduction, SCR. Um, and the question we got asked was, what about the cost for consumables? Now, in our experience, this would always be known as expense. And, and that's something that, you know, if you want to ask any questions on, we can we can bring that out out of the webinar. Please feel free to contact us. We're, we're more than happy to discuss that at a later date. Um, so then it just brings me really, I've got a couple of quick questions I just want to ask you, David, before we move on to the next bit and I hand the floor over. And the first one is we've touched on it before there, but it was to do with exhaust gas you know, cleaning systems. And in our experience, many of the smaller shipping companies left it a little bit too late to make the relevant changes to decide what they're doing. Do you see the same problem over the horizon here as we look to 2023, David, in your opinion, and, and, and George? Yeah. So, so good morning, Mark, and good morning, everyone. Um, with regards to um, your concerns about leaving late, we, we, we think there's a lot of... Um, people within our industry have been waiting to see the outcome of the latest MEPC. So it's not so much as leaving late uh, as, as, as anticipating the events at IMO last week 
and and I think this, um, as I, I was going to say later, that th this webinar is extremely timely because I think this will be the the the, the bell to start the the major movement forward. So from from the people that we have seen, we, we are lucky enough to deal with a whole spectrum of, of owners and operators, and and frankly, we are seeing uh, owners uh, in in every part of that spectrum taking um, uh, taking an interest in these these new requirements but we also are aware of many that um, are waiting to see and waiting for the clarifications that, can, that have come from from last week so um, I, I think it, it's a mixed bag so, some are aware and, and are preparing particularly ones with large fleets others um, particularly in some of the sectors that are have been challenged recently from from the economics point of view, are waiting to see uh, how to move how to move forward. And perhaps I could ask George just just a, a quick additional comment on that, if there's anything you'd like to add. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, David. Thanks, Mark. Um, no, uh, David, you were spot on. That's exactly what we've seen. Um, the main reason behind, uh, if there was any delay. Um, was the fact that uh, the there was a, a significant need for regulatory clarity. Not that we have uh, we have received the utter and uh, ultimate regulatory clarity next uh, last week during MAPC, and we will address a couple of things that need to be clarified further. Mark, you also mentioned uh, enforcement uh, exclusions, um, those set of, of clarifications that uh, we we need in order to. Uh, to have a proper uh, picture of how this landscape will actually um, solidify. Um, these are going to be uh, provided in the next MEPCs. Um, however, uh, over the last, uh, let's say, half a year, six months, we have seen a rise in the uh, requirements uh, for support uh, as uh, a, a significant number of operators and owners um, were asking um, support on how these next uh, requirements, what are the next steps so that um, they can start strategizing their next moves. As you have very well uh, mentioned, Mark, um, it's this is not too early to start uh, working on, on the next moves and identifying the pathways towards compliance for the next regulatory milestones. OK, thank you. That's, that's excellent. Thank you. OK, well, at that point, then, I would just like to hand over the presentation to David and Georgios. And then following on from David and Georgios, Helen will go into the contractual side of it from the Charter Party. So thank you. I'll hand over to you now. So uh, good morning, everyone, again. Um, I'd just like to thank um, Mark and his colleagues at the North for the opportunity to speak to you today. I think this is an extremely timely webinar, and both Georgios and I believe this is an extremely important subject that affects our industry going for forward. So, um, so as Mark mentioned earlier, the pressures arising from the drive to decarbonise shipping are creating a new emerging landscape of regula regulations, which clearly have the potential to reshape our industry. So the IMO is developing short term measures to reduce carbon emissions that have both technical as well as operational elements, as, as Mark pointed out. These measures aim to accelerate the compliance with the IMO's long-term climate change goals by the application of the concept of the Energy Efficiency Design Index applied to existing ships, the so-called EEXI. This is complemented by the carbon intensity indicator requirements, which will track the actual carbon intensity of a vessel and apply a reduction strategy, the carbon intensity being the CO2 per ton mile. At the, uh, by the 1st of January 2023, EEXI will be applied in the form of a technical filter or gateway, if you like, that vessels will have to pass through. If they do not meet this requirement, owners will be required to explore remedial options that will make the vessels compliant. In most cases, compliance, as Marcus pointed out, will be achieved through the application 
of an engine power limitation, the so-called EPL, and that will be, of course, in conjunction with slow steaming. However, if that is not enough of a reduction, other options, including retrofitting with energy efficiency technologies, such as vanes or ducts or propeller boss cap fins, or, or even in some cases, the modification of hull form may be required. And further, if further, efficient, if further reduction is required, low carbon fuel or a combination of all may be considered. At the same time, once a vessel has met the EXI requirements, it will immediately have to start reducing its carbon intensity. Following a downward trajectory, until the 40% reduction target is met in 2030. And of course, this is measured against the 2008 levels. However, EXI compliance is only the first step. And the significance of the CII regulations should not be underestimated. It may be more challenging than EXI because it is ongoing and will be calculated based on the vessel's actual fuel consumption reported through the IMO data collection system, the DCS. As Mark pointed out, and, and as George will discuss later, each vessel will receive an annual grade from A to E, which may, and I put may in inverted commas, impact a vessel's marketability and its value. The CII measures will impose a decarbonation trajectory, but it's not the only trajectory that shipping assets vessels will have to follow. Regional regulatory requirements will effectively create additional decarbonisation trajectories against which vessels will have to align. The European Union Emissions Trading Scheme, the ETS, could be applied to shipping in 2022. It will allocate carbon allowances to shipping or to ships and will reduce those allowances on an annual basis until the required carbon intensity reduction is met in, 2020, in 2030. But state other, there are other stakeholders moving fast with initiatives to align with their own ESG policies. Financial institutions, that fund shipping have established the Poseidon principles in order to track the carbon intensity of their vessels in their portfolio and, re and report back to their investors. Similarly, the charterers have followed suit with the Sea Cargo Charter, which also aims to track the carbon intensity of the vessels for which they are chartered. So we believe that this visual metaphor is appropriate. While the EXI is a visible call to action and will result in a tangible modifications to vessels, we should not underestimate the less obvious impact of the CII. So quickly, and some key dates for you, um, and these will be in the presentation, which will be available later. So amendments to MARPOL Annex 6 are expected to enter into force on the 1st of November 2022, with the requirements for EXI and CII certification coming into effect from the 1st of January 2023. This means that the first annual re reporting will be completed in 2023, with the first rating given in 2024. It is important to note that there is a review clause that requires the IMO to review the effectiveness of the implementation of CII and EXI by no later than the 1st of January 2026, and if necessary, develop and adopt further amendments to MARPOL. So now that I've set the scene, I will pass on to my colleague, Georgios Plavrakis, our Director of Global Director of Sustainability at ABS, ABS and Georgios will develop, delve a little deeper into the technical details and outline what we can recommend 
as that an owner should do to prepare. Thank you, David. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, ask Mark, should we take uh, the questions that are coming in uh, on the text box right now or should we wait until the Q&A at the end? Because if there was a question that was raised. If you're happy doing it now, George. Let's, just, let's, yeah. let's do it yeah. right now. Yeah. Okay, so I saw a question about the CII in 2019. The 2019 year is going to be used as the reference year for the reduction uh, rates after that until we meet the 2030 um, uh, target that was posed by IMO and the shorter measures. Um, this was uh, decided after a, a number of months and uh, work in the correspondence groups. Um, and it was informed by the third and fourth greenhouse gas study that were submitted to IMO last year. So um, the uh, let's say if we can use this um, uh, this terminology, we uh, we can say that 2019 is the year where we start calculating the reductions until we meet the 2030 mark. Um, and we have a we have a, a slide that actually shows. Uh, what those reduction rates will be on an annual basis. So let's kick uh, kickstart this part of the presentation uh, by creating a link to what uh, my colleague uh, David was saying earlier. And what we have on the next slide is key changes that happened since last week, and this is um, uh, 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 straight from the newsroom. Um, uh, what we have seen is that um, there was a, a debate on the reduction uh, factors on the annual reduction rates uh, on the CII, but a harsher implementation on the EXI. And let me explain. What we have, uh, what we had initially, was the requirement of a 70% calc of 70% um, uh, factor to, to calculate the engine. Um, uh, edge stalled engine power uh, in order to uh, to uh, estimate whether the vessel complies or not with the EXI. If an engine power, <coughs> excuse me, if an engine power limitation is to be applied, now the uh, the agreed uh, text of the regulation requires 83% of engine power to be calculated in the EXI formula. Effectively, what does that mean? It means that uh, uh, the, the vessels will have to apply an extra almost 10% in most of the cases in engine power limitation, as we call it, an EPL, in order for them to comply with the requirement of EXI. The other thing that we need to highlight here, and this is very, very important, and we have seen that this is overlooked at, at many times, is that we are now talking about an overridable or a non-overridable engine power limitation. Uh, Mark earlier described um, the uh, possibility of reducing the engine power to meet the EXI requirement. David also mentioned that as an option to comply with this particular requirement. What we have now in place is a distinction between whether the EPL can be overrided or not. If it cannot be overrided, then we're back to 70% um, to the 70% uh, 75% calculation. If it is overridable, and in the majority of the cases, this is what we're going to have. We're talking about an 83% uh, applied in the calculation of the EXI. As far as the CII is concerned. We have the annual reduction rates for 2020 until 2026, and those are going to be applied in two phases. Phase one, we have a 1% annual reduction rate starting from 2020 until 2022. Reference year again is 2019. And then um, we will apply a 2% annual reduction rate until 2026. This is described as uh, phase two. In 2026, we are going to have a revisionary MEPC, and that MEPC will reflect back on whether the um, anticipated reduction in the carbon uh, intensity uh, of the industry has been achieved, and whether we are aligned with the target for 2030. 
uh, and uh, that will actually set that 2026 MEPC will set the further reduction rates uh, for phase three. Now, um, having discussed briefly about the mechanics of those two uh, short term measures and the very latest updates coming uh, for, uh, as news from last week's MEPC, um, we tried to uh, address the potential impact that these measures will have on the industry. And what we have seen is that if you look at the major ship categories, bulk carriers, container ships, tankers and gas carriers, the latter includes both LPG and LNG carriers. The number of vessels that are estimated uh, that are that will require improvement in order to become compliant with EXI um, are significant. We see 87% of bulk carriers, 88% of container ships, 85% of tankers, and 95% of ca uh, gas carriers. In most of the cases, this will be achieved by an engine power limitation. And in the most recent uh, vessel designs, this will be achieved through uh, a, a small engine power limitation. Um, however, we have also to underline the fact that uh, the uh, EXI follows the EEDI uh, application and calculation principles. Uh, and therefore, there are there are significant um, uh, the impact will be significant on the vessels that are above a certain age before mainly 2013. As far as the CII is concerned, if you look at the data sets that we have in place for the different vessel categories, the, uh, and if you extend that to 2030, given the reduction uh, factors, the annual reduction factors that we have in place, we see that. Uh, there is going to be uh, a significant effort to stay within the ratings under C until we meet the 2030 target. 86% of bulk carriers, 92% of container ships, 74% of tankers, 80% of gas carriers, and 59% of LNG carriers will have to, uh, to either apply some sort of an operational or a technical improvement in order to remain below the C rating. A lot has been discussed about CII, and therefore uh, we feel that it would be um, viable if we discussed a bit um, the mechanics of that. CII, as we said, and Mark mentioned that, also David, will apply on ships above 5,000 GT. It will be informed by the uh, IMO DCS scheme. Now, the uh, exclusions uh, are not yet set. They have been pushed for adoption in MEPC 77 and uh, it will apply a rating mechanism that will rate the vessels from A to B, depending on how far above or below they are from that annual CII carbon intensity required, required uh, limit, the requirement. Uh, uh, one thing to underline here is the fact that if a vessel finds itself in T category or in category E, uh, D in three for three consecutive years or E for just one year, then it will have to apply corrective actions that will bring it back to the required carbon intensity of the next year. The uh, SCMP uh, will have to also incorporate an implementation plan uh, before we enter into this regulatory scheme. And if corrective actions have to be applied, then they will, it will have to incorporate a corrective action plan uh, for this, um, uh, these corrections to take place. Um, the reference lines, uh, we have the, already the, uh, the reference lines for the different vessel categories. What we were missing, and now we have it, is this Z factor that you see on this calculation, and this is given in the three phases that we have in place since last week. The boundaries for each different rating have also been set, so we know what is the distance from the mean, from the sea line in order to achieve rating A, rating B, or therefore to achieve rating D and E above the, above the sea line. Therefore, if we take all this into consideration, uh, 
Um, what we highlight is the fact that a, a company and an operator, a ship owner, needs to start um, uh, uh, cre creating an overview of the fleet that uh, 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 is being operated um, by doing a CII fleet benchmarking, uh, extending its view towards 2030 and identifying which vessels will be the best players and which, which vessels will be more problematic. In this example, what you see on this slide is uh, a vessel that is will be rated D straight from the beginning of the introduction of this uh, of this regulation, and therefore it should be prior, prior, prioritized for investigation of improvement options and incorporation of those into the SCMP implementation plan. The other thing that you see on this slide is uh, a, an overview of this particular fleet applying the fleet uh, CII benchmarking. There was a proposal also to apply that. Uh, however, uh, it didn't uh, receive um, uh, any, any agreement on this MEPC. It has been pushed for further discussion in the next MEPCs. We discussed about the necessity of building an implementation plan in the SCMP. And this is highly required because it will actually uh, help an operator and a ship owner identify how a vessel will comply constantly in the next years as we meet the um, as we reach the 2030 mark um, with the required CII. If if we have to look at each particular vessel and figure out what type of improvement options in the in the form of propulsion power savings and uh, how this can be also combined with uh, optimization of speed in this in this case we call it speed reduction then we need to map those combinations and create therefore the implementation plan so that we can have this in place and uh, get ready for uh, the compliance of this particular vessel if we need um, to apply improvement options, then we also have to see how these different uh, approaches, these different options, uh, the uh, introduction of en energy efficiency technologies with a combination of the uh, speed reduction, how will that affect the different rating of the vessel? And therefore, we can start mapping how these combinations will affect a particular uh, the particular vessel against different ratings what you see on this uh, graph is a mapping of the different ratings that this particular vessel achieves at a particular year by applying a combination of improvement options either through an energy efficiency technology uh, or and or uh, engine power um, speed reduction and as you can see, as we move towards 2030, this is a dynamic uh, approach. It constantly changes as the, the uh, trajectory um, also uh, takes us down to the 2030 levels. And therefore, the operator can uh, see in advance what the rating will be of that particular vessel if improvement options are applied. Therefore, what we urge now is um, we need to have in place this benchmarking of the fleet and vessels and then prioritize which vessels are going to have to be looked further into in order to explore improvement options in the future and as cii kicks into into gear we need to have in place a robust monitoring system where we can have this um, uh, implementation being uh, incorporating um, data and therefore the calibration and the validation is being made so that um, we can constantly monitor how we perform against the trajectories that have been set related to CII. Um, and I will uh, also say a few uh, words on the EXI. We discussed a bit that a bit about EXI uh, earlier. It is a filter and EXI will be applied on the 1st of January 2023 and vessels will have to show that they are in compliance with that requirement on the first annual intermediate or renewal survey, whichever comes first after that date. 
in uh, the vessels will have to comply with that EXI in order to achieve and receive the International Energy Efficiency Certificate. Therefore, compliance will also provide the license to trade. There are differ uh, different um, improvement options that have been captured by the text of the regulation. The most uh, popular uh, option will be the engine power limitation and therefore the um, exploration of how um, in, uh, intense the engine power limitation should be in order to uh, uh, also uh, preserve the commercial viability of the vessel is of utmost importance. It will apply. It will be applied on all ship categories, uh, regardless of whether of when they were built. Uh, the exceptions. There are a couple of exceptions, particularly OSV vessels and and uh, work vessels. I'd like to highlight here the fact that we have seen also relative new vessels uh, within the uh, coming into the uh, EEDI scheme and uh, contracted after 2013 that will probably have to apply some sort of correct or, uh, corrective action to improvement option in order for them to comply with the EXI. Please keep uh, that 2013 date in mind and the fact that when we are looking at EEDI and EXI compliance, the contractual date is of utmost importance because the EEDI levels are preserved for eight years after contractual dates by the yard and therefore you can have a vessel that has been contracted eight years before. It will be delivered uh, next year and still not be in compliance with EXI. So this is a very, very critical thing that we need to have uh, in our heads. We need to take note. Um, EDI and EXI follow contractual dates, not delivery dates, contractual dates. We discussed about the fact that EXI follows the EDI calculation, the, um, uh, the, the framework and the, uh, the guidelines uh, are more or less adopted. What has been pushed for adoption in MEPC 77 are certain verification guidelines that uh, are still uh, in discussions. However, the, um, the general framework is uh, already in place. The only change that we had was that 83 percent uh, in the calculation formula that I mentioned. The reduction factors are set. What you see on this slide is the different reduction factors that have to be implemented against the reference line of 2013. That's the EDI phase zero. That's why I mentioned earlier and I emphasize that contractual date of the vessels. And in order for us to understand then how all these things make sense, here's a practical example. This is an actual case and we have been conducting studies, benchmarking studies and exploring improvement options against the EXI, um, uh, the EXI requirements for almost uh, uh, six months now. We have reached the number of around a thousand. This is one of the cases that we have seen. We are talking about uh, here a bulk area of 70,000 dead weight. It was uh, built in uh, year, uh, in year 2006. Now the estimated EXI, the estimated current EXI for this particular vessel is 4.12. The EDI reference line, the line against which uh, against which we will compare this uh, vessel is uh, 4.54, and the required reduction factor is 20%. And therefore, the required the required EXI, the EXI that this vessel has to achieve, is 3.63. It will have to apply a reduction of almost 30% on its engine power in order to, up, to comply with this requirement. And what you see on this table is a combination of, uh, of the engine power limitation of engine power reduction with a propulsion power saving so that compliance can be achieved. I will just stick to the first two, starting from right to left. If you start with 29.9%, 30% engine power limitation, then you would require no energy efficiency technology or any other power propulsion power saving. However, if you need to apply a smaller EPL, a smaller engine power limitation because of commercial commitments, then what you see is that you would require a power propulsion, a power propulsion saving 
propulsion power saving of almost 15 percent, which is a bit challenging to find from energy efficiency technologies. Therefore, and I'm concluding, challenges with this regulation, uh, we have CII and EXI that are um, forming. We have more or less a, a, a concrete now approach on the EXI. Uh, the exclusions of the CII are not yet defined, and that is very, very critical. How you balance your the commercial commitment, the commitments of the vessel against the introduction of an engine power limitation is of utmost importance, and that's why we need to have this benchmarking and exploration of improvement options in place sooner than later, because everything that needs to be done needs to be done in, in a year and a half, and the planning, the project management uh, needs time, and therefore uh, we cannot start early enough. Uh, SIP specific information and documentation is of utmost importance, particularly also if you will need to, uh, to build the EXI technical file that will be required for compliance. And we have also seen vessels that have already incorporated technologies that these technologies have not been verified against the uh, engine, the uh, propulsion power savings that they provide. And therefore, all these elements are critical and the preparation uh, of the uh, of, of the uh, strategy is is important to start today. Key highlight uh, EXI technical file is something that we also need to start uh, exploring. Um, how do we build the EXI technical file? It needs documentation, supportive documentation to support the calculations that are placed in this technical file, and that's something that uh, requires some work to be done. This is why we urge this type of activities to start sooner than later. Um, we have a global team to assist on all these activities and studies and support. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we have a sustainability center across the globe uh, and we can uh, serve at all um, time zones. Thank you for your attention. That's uh, I hope that uh, we've covered everything in the uh, in the uh, amount of time that uh, we had. I'm looking yeah. forward for your questions. Great, thank you very much, Georgios and David. That was excellent, very interesting, and, and filled in a lot of the gaps mainly, which is what we wanted about. Um, we're, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to hand very quickly over to Helen. Um, just before I go on to that, I'm going to very cheekily say, obviously, we like to look after our members. So one thing I've raised with ABS, and they're probably going to laugh at me when I say this, is that if you're a North member and you go and approach ABS about this, you don't have classification with them, they may try and look at a bit of a favourable rate for you. But I'll leave that up to, to uh, George and David to decide. And uh, But yeah, that's, that's Ma something that Ma you'll be able to help with. Mark, we will always provide a competitive rate. Yeah, yeah, OK. All right, that's excellent. Well, I'm going to pass on to Helen now, and then we'll take the presentation from there. Thanks, Helen. Um, thanks, Mark, and thanks, David and George. Yes, and good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to now have a look at the charter party considerations, um, and I'm going to go back to the hypothetical carbon traders case study that Mark outlined earlier. Um, to hopefully make the topic a little less dry. Um, so I'll turn to that shortly. But um, <clears throat> first, it's obviously clear that with there being so many variables with the different vessel types and specifications, ages, etc., cetera, um, and due to the options currently available to reduce carbon emissions, whether technically or operationally, and the varying views on what's on the horizon, to meet the ultimate goal of net zero emissions, there is no one size fits all or silver bullet when it comes to what owners and charters should be doing to meet their decarbonisation obligations. Um, and therefore, how these issues are going to be reflected in the charter parties will obviously vary. Um, clearly, as soon as we're looking at modifications to vessels or power limitation or restricting how a vessel can be operated, then it's going to affect the rights and obligations within the charter parties. Um, as such, parties are going to need to review how the costs and risks of complying with the regulations will be allocated in the charter parties. Um, helpfully, it is generally understood in the industry that the only way in which the IMO targets are going to be achieved is with cooperation between all of the stakeholders. 
and therefore while limiting a vessel's power, for example, is obviously going to cut across a charterer's use of the vessel, um, it's expected that owners and charterers will be working together, albeit there's always going to be commercial considerations that require careful negotiation. Um, <clears throat> Mark and David and Georges have obviously already spoken about the need to consider EEXI benchmarking um, before properly considering what charter party clauses need to be addressed to meet the requirements. Um, and this is to allow for as much clarity in the charter party drafting as possible. Um, in the event of clauses being too general or not covering all of the risks and rights, etc., this can obviously lead to disputes down the line. So to illustrate these points, I'm going to have a look through the um, through the case studies um, outlined by Mark. Um, obviously, these are hypothetical, um, and I should just sort of flag that um, addressing any technical and operational changes in charter parties should always be looked at as a whole, but um, due to time and um, for the purpose of this webinar, I'm sort of looking at it in a, a bit more of an isolated way. Um, so on the JBCs, um, just to recap, EEXI benchmarking has been carried out um, and suggests that um, power limitation at 75% MCR and installation of energy saving devices for um, getting the IEEC certification. The JBCs is currently um, under time charter, which is shortly going to be coming to an end, and the new charter party is going to span 2023 um, and needs to be negotiated with EEXI and CII in mind. So owners are wanting to know what they need to consider amending or including to address these technical changes. So in terms of power limitation and charter party considerations and the following um, could be borne in mind, the vessel description um, and any um, relevant changes to speed and consumption warranties to be addressed accordingly. Also, in the event the um, power meter is to be installed during the course of the charter party, then provision should be included um, for that to provide owners with the right to do that, um, as well as inclusion of the right to correct the vessel description and any speed and consumption warranties and other relevant clauses um, at that time. So in terms of the installation of the energy saving devices, unless any other agreement is reached with the charterers, um, the time and cost of installation is going to be for the owner's account. Um, as for the um, charter party, the following considerations are worth um, bearing in mind. The time for carrying out any required modifications, including, if necessary, a provision allowing for the vessel to deviate to dry dock for installation of the devices. Um, provisions dealing with maintenance might also need amending. Um, as with power limitation, the vessel description and warranties, such as speed and consumption, um, may also need to be revised to account for any efficiencies given by the energy saving devices. From a charterer's perspective, um, charterers are going to want to understand their rights and remedies in the event that owners fail to meet the required EXI or fail to obtain the IEE certification. Um, turning to the options owners are intending to implement to achieve the CII uh, requirements, um, owners want to encourage charterers to avoid long stays at port and to implement just-in-time principles. Um, as well as improving efficiencies um, in terms of bunker savings, that's also preferable from a hull fouling perspective. The BIMCO slow steaming clause for time charter parties 2011 could be considered here, uh, as well as the BIMCO port call data exchange clause. Under the charter party terms, it's likely that the vessel will need to proceed using, for example, utmost dispatch. Uh, there may be a failure to prosecute the voyage with um, utmost dispatch where, without good reason, the master sails at a reduced speed or takes a route other than the shortest and the quickest. However, in some cases, it may be that the shortest route between two points isn't necessarily the most fuel efficient um, because of currents or wave heights or winds, etc. Um, so owners may want to include an express right to do that. And the already mentioned BIMCO slow steaming cause can complement this requirement because it um, provides that the owners shall exercise due diligence to minimise fuel consumption. And that due diligence includes making use of weather routing and voyage optimisation. 
Um, again, as with the EXI requirements from a charterer's perspective for CII, the charterers are likely um, to want some certainty as regards the vessel's um, CII rating during the currency of the charter party and perhaps um, remedies in the event the vessel's CII rating drops. Um, turning to the next scenario, please, Mark. So <clears throat> owners generally um, in this situation um, usually voyage charter out their ta uh, tanker vessels directly, and that's the case for the Emerald Seas vessel. This makes it perhaps more straightforward in terms of any modifications that the owners may need to undertake to meet EEXI requirements, albeit there may be certain things that will need to follow through into charter parties in relation to descriptions, etc. Um, however, in this scenario, the owners are keen to address operational measures in their voyage charters and they want to start introducing these with their charters now. Um, there are obviously certain legal obligations under voyage charters which don't necessarily encourage energy uh, fuel efficiency. So, for example, the obligation on the owners to proceed to the load port um, with due dispatch, with demurrage itself being um, an indicator of inefficiency. So, clearly, it's not fuel efficient to have to proceed at an excessive speed and get to a point and have to wait once you're there for a berthing slot. So, <clears throat> without um, any express wording in the charge party to address this, um, owners would be in breach of their dispatch obligation um, and charters would be able to claim da damages if they if they didn't um, proceed with the uh, due dispatch. Of course, the consideration of fuel efficient voyages and port optimization um, shouldn't stop with just the uh, voyage to the low port, but it's also relevant to the discharge port and any interim ports. As well as the reduced um, fuel consumption, as mentioned before, uh, it would be it would also impact upon the um, re reduced hull, likely reduced hull fouling as well, which is obviously an important efficiency consideration. So here, the BIMCO just in time arrivals clause, which was um, published this year, could be considered, as well as the BIMCO port core data exchange clause, again published um, earlier this year. Um, finally, um, as with the previous scenario, there may there may be an express clause included um, if that's agreed to allow the master to proceed the most fuel efficient route. So the next one, thanks, Mark. Um, in this scenario of the turquoise seas, which is a container ship and under long term time charter um, and will span 2023, EEXI benchmarking is being undertaken at the moment, so the measures that owners um, will use in this regard aren't yet known. The existing charter party hasn't included any provisions for amendments to deal with EEXI or CII requirements, and owners are obviously mindful that this needs to be dealt with in the charter party in due course. Um, to the extent that they are obviously able to agree those variations with the existing charterers. Um, it's perhaps worth noting, which should uh, probably helps answer the, the latest question, um, that the sooner the EEXI benchmarking and CII benchmarking are carried out so that owners can understand how possible modifications and operational changes could impact upon their obligations as owners under the charter party, the sooner discussions can take place with existing charterers regarding the impact upon those charter parties that are going to span 2023 and are already in place. So, of course, if owners wish to, for example, um, limit the vessel's power um, or dry dock to modify the vessel and they're not already catered for, the right to do that isn't already catered for in the charter party. Um, and unless those um, those points can be negotiated and agreed with the charterers, then there is potential for a breach um, by the owners under the charter party, which is why we're saying the sooner discussions can take place, um, the better. Some charter parties do include um, clauses that require owners and charterers to discuss how to deal with regulatory changes, um, which require modifications to vessel, but often those clauses don't really define the party's responsibilities beyond that. 
So just turning back to the um, current scenario for the turquoise seas, um, while awaiting the outcome of the EEXI benchmarking process, in the meantime, the charters have made a proposal to owners that they'd like to use um, biofuels. So the points that might need to be considered if um, a trial of biofuels is to be undertaken or biofuels are to be used um, for the vessel are um, obviously all of the clause, clauses relating to bunkers will need to be considered, such as bunker quality and specification, as well as bunker price and bunkers on delivery and re-delivery. Um, the specification of the biofuel will need to be addressed because there's no standard specification for biofuels. Um, ISO 8217 is a fossil fuel standard, um, so whilst it could be used for guideline purposes, there are missing parameters that are relevant to biofuels. Um, and others that are perhaps not relevant. So from a charter party perspective, if biofuels are to be used, then wording could be included, for example, that the charters are to provide biofuels of a quality and specification which are approved by the engine manufacturer. Uh, in terms of the um, quality of the biofuel, one of the biggest concerns is the fact that because there is no standard specification, there is a risk that suppliers could provide um, poor quality biofuel. Um, consideration should be given to the performance warranty. Biofuel fuels use a little bit more um, fuel than fossil fuels for the same proportion, and so that should be addressed. Potential inclusion of tank cleaning clauses and consideration of maintenance clauses and dry docking clauses. Um, Consideration should also be given to what could happen in the event of the time loss or cost being incurred as, as a result of a biofuel trial and how those are going to be all allocated. Um, and finally, consideration of whether alternative fuels need to be provided for in the event of non-availability of the agreed biofuel. And if so, um, how that's going to be addressed in the in the charter party. So that's a very quick canter through um, charter party issues, very mindful of the fact that we're running over. Obviously, um, as I mentioned before, when there are any technical or operational changes, um, these are going to need to be looked at, looking at the charter party as a whole, um, not different clauses in isolation. So um, that's always very important to bear in mind. And if you do require any assistance in this regard, then Obviously, please don't hesitate to contact your usual FD&D contact um, or the decarbonisation group, which brings me to the end. So, Mark, if there are any questions we've missed. No, no, thank you very much, Helen. You've uh, you've covered the question now that was answered in, in the middle of your section now, which is great. Um, we've received another question and well, there's two more questions came. So the first one I think I'll answer and then the other question is directed at Georgios. So I'll go from there. The, the, the first question is about biofuel damages to the main engine. Now, there's no easy answer here, but I would treat it very much as you would a normal fuel in that, you know, if an owner is changing over to biofuels, you need to prepare as much as possible for the use of biofuels. And part of that preparation is to ensure all your tanks are cleaned, your systems are ready. You know, you've discussed with the charters the quality of the fuel and you're sure that the quality of the fuel they are providing is to the required standard. Now, we've written a biofuels article on this, which is freely available on our website. We can, if anybody wants this, I can pass it across to you. But what that highlights is the importance of the biofuel quality and to make sure that it's not of a lesser standard. So they're the conversations you need to be having with the charters before they start commencing trials on your vessel. So you need to really know a bit of background about the biofuels they intend to use. On top of that, it's all about preservation of evidence and, and collecting as much evidence as possible. And like I say, if you start off with good clean tanks and good systems, then if you do have any problems throughout the use of these fuels, then you can document it and say, well, look, you know, everything is in good working order. Uh, you know, all of our plant, all of our machinery, all of our tanks are clean and the samples that we've got you know, show that there's a particular problem with this biofuel. So really it is about the owners protecting themselves at the start 
by having the conversation with the charters, making sure they're satisfied with the quality of the biofuels, but thereafter also ensuring they keep as much evidence as possible, carry out as much testing as possible. And that's where the similarities will come with the use of normal fuels. You know, um, charters may supply, in some cases, substandard VLSFO quality fuels, you know, but it's the owners, it's the charters that should be supplying the correct quality fuels, but the owners have to really have the alarm bells raised so that they're looking out for the use of these fuels and they can protect their engines accordingly. Because if you cause damage to the engine, it's very hard to then go back and prove. It's easier to try and prevent it from happening from the start. So that's just what I want to say on that. The next question is, is to Georgios. Um, you can say that question, Georgios. So I'll, I'll let you discuss yes, that, the, please. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have received a couple of questions about the application of EPL, the 83% and 75% uh, factor on the calculation. Um, and uh, this is very well justified, particularly the text in the regulation is very, very confusing. Um, so I, I will try to, to do my best to, uh, to provide some clarity on this. Uh, if, if we need to apply an EPL, an engine power limitation, in order to comply with an EXI, then we need to use the 83%. Now this changes if the EPL is non-overridable, as they call it. There is a, a, a clause in the text, in the, uh, in the agreed regulation as it is, that uh, describes an overridable EPL and a non-overridable EPL. What does that mean? It means that if you have, in the case of a non-overridable uh, EPL, that is, and I see that uh, some of, uh, uh, of the participants have already raised that about TC cutouts or um, cylinder cutoffs, permanent um, uh, uh, alterations, permanent um, uh, modifications to the machinery that reduces in a non-overridable uh, manner the engine power. Uh, that means that if in, uh, in a case of, uh, let's say, adverse weather or emergency, uh, the uh, engine has to go back to the previous power, it will not be able to do so. In this case, we can still use the 75%. Uh, in any other case, when we apply an EPL, for example, if you have an electronic engine and then you have to use a, a software update, um, or if you have a stop screw, as they call them on the uh, on the racks of the engine, then that is an override. It is considered overridable. It can be overrided in an emergency case, and therefore we use the 83% approach. Um, this is the distinction between 83 and 75. It is. It has to do with whether you are applying an EPL. One uh, question and second, if you are applying an EPL, is that overridable or not? That's how you uh, you need to approach this. Okay, thank you very much, Georgios. Thanks. Um, the only other thing there is you'll see Helen that somebody's asked for a copyation of the presentation slides and and BIMCO closes, but we can. We can follow that later. Um, well, I mean, we've we've gone a little bit over, but that's a good sign. We've had some questions, you know. Um, what I really want to say here to everybody is, well, thank you very much to to David, George, Yoss, and Helen uh, for for giving you know an excellent show here and and presenting some very useful information. What this is designed to do is open up the doors of communication. So please feel free to contact any of us now to ask questions, you know, and, and, and you know, ask us what you can do and what we can do to help. This is just the start of a journey, you know, and we just want to try and promote the earliest start of this journey possible. So um, thank you very much to everybody for the time. Any questions, please feel free to follow up afterwards to, to any of us. We're more than happy to help and uh, we hope you all have a very pleasant day ahead and, uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much, everybody.